I'm not sure it was obvious, but let's get started. Uh, Mr. Hall cannot be here tonight. He asked me to, as the vice chair, to take his place, which I uh, graciously will do. So you're going to have to put up with me tonight for the time being. Uh, first thing to do is let's call the order. We've got quorum seven. Uh, Secretary of Court, Anthony. Mr. Chair, I reviewed the regular meeting minutes of October 19, 2017, and I make a motion that we approve the minutes I'll as written. A second. We got a motion. We've got a second um, for Mr. Itinerary. Uh, do we have any discussion? We have seen none. Uh, call for a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, all opposed? Any abstain? Thank you very much. So be it. All right, let's go down to Treasury Report. Ms. Hawley. Yes. Um, so enclosed um, or available at the meeting the October 31st, 2017 Treasury Report. At the end of the month, we had $6,554,853.30, $6,010,362.41 were in local funds, and $544,498.89 were in project funds. Um, the the uh, month was a busy month in terms of receipts. Uh, you can see that the uh, Member assessments uh, were due November 1st, so we did get a significant portion of assessments in uh, prior to that date. Um, we also um, had a significant amount of activity under student activities, as we have been having since the opening of the school year. Um, productivity revolving in grant funds are also um, been pretty active. Um, expenses for the month have been right in line with the uh, budget. Um, did anybody have any questions? All members in? Yes, all members are in. Um, yes, as of the date of this meeting. Will we accept as written? Oh, second it. Uh, we've got a uh, chat. We've got Ms. Like, Lightning right again. Second it. Uh, we, uh, we have a second on that, so we open for discussion. E? Hearing none, okay. Let's call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? So moved. Thank you very much, Barbara. Now let's move to uh, item number four, student recognition, Dr. Fitz. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, it is my pleasure to recognize Zoe Martin. So we press it? Yes. Yeah, there she is. Thank you. Uh, ask, usually invite our principal, our assistant superintendent, Mr. Steele, to join me on these. And we'll do that, please. <coughs> They're with me because Zoe has a variety of skills <laughs> that she's in. She is in the class of 2019 in automotive technology. She's an Oxford resident. As a freshman, she was one of two freshmen to earn a spot in the elite edition of the Capella Group of Chromatics. Since then, she has remained one of the 12 members each year. She is the vice president of our chorus group. Ms. Rosansky nominated her to take part in the high school honors performance series and this a particularly talented student, submitted two recordings of her singing, including learning and performing a song in Italian. I do some of my Italian, but not on TV. <laughs> 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 I took it. Come on up, we got the Google Chrome oh, logo right yeah, there. There okay. we go. For the, for the television. Oh. <laughs> she has committed herself to private uh, voice lessons outside of school, in addition to spending extra time with our uh, music instructor, course instructor, Mr. Zansky, and to prepare for her nomination process and the upcoming performance. Acceptance to the elite group is a direct result of her talent, dedication, and achievements demonstrated in her application and audition recording. And the, group, the press, release, press release actually reads uh, very favorably. So I will travel to New York City to perform at Carnegie Hall with students from around the world under the direction of the highly regarded conductors. So congratulations. Allison and Lise, are they here? Yes. Would you please come forward? Please. Please, right. 
these two uh, members of our student body uh, took it upon themselves to recognize that one of our staff members was dealing with a life-threatening uh, challenge. Uh, and they created what's known throughout the school system, maybe throughout Massachusetts, if not New England, Yancic Strong, which includes the bracelets, if you will, that were used as a fundraiser. Uh, among other things, they organized uh, some 150 of us to participate in a walk around the Boston Common as part of a national uh, recognition uh, for uh, the need to continue to investigate uh, in, in any challenges that someone might face. So this type of initiation, this type of creativity, this type of going outside the standard way of helping uh, and showcasing is all about the spirit and the culture that we promote at Valley Tech. Clearly our employers recognize that um, the teaming, the, the camaraderie, the, the strength of working cooperatively, cooperatively and, and collectively and respectfully uh, is so critical to the productivity of the workforce. And so I wanted to acknowledge it was a pleasure to join you in the, in the Boston Comet activity. It was a delightful experience uh, and, and a, a brisk walk around the Comet. Uh, but uh, you know, I wish to publicly acknowledge on behalf of uh, Mr. Steele, the leadership team, the school committee, and our full school community, uh, your leadership and your fine example of community service. Well done. Thank you. Very good. Uh, next, we have comments by our student representatives, Carl and Jake. So, just recently, the BBT Student Council also took place uh, in the walk of Boston Valley for Mr. Yancic. The Student Council had about 20 to 25 members, uh, and as Dr. Fitzpatrick said, there was about 150 students uh, present. Last Wednesday at uh, one of our general council meetings, we started our annual turkey run drive. This year we have 20 families, so we divided the entire student council into 20 different groups. And in our groups we create, we take WB Mason boxes and we create Thanksgiving baskets for families in need in the BBT community. So we get turkeys, uh, rolls, stuffing, and all the way to table setting. Um, this year, next Tuesday, we will be running our turkey run drive is when Everyone will bring in their items. We create our baskets, and the families come and pick them up from the school. We also just had our fall conference recently. Uh, Forty of our members in student council attended it, and myself and another student presented a workshop at the event. And we had a guest spe guest speaker uh, named Patrick Mount. And our annual holiday drive is starting up on November 29th, and will go until uh, December 20th. Questions? Sure. Yes. You know, this season, this is the season where there's a lot of fundraising and at, at the homecoming game, there's a lot of booths set up, fundraising and all. Compared to other years, how, how involved is, 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 the, is the class this year? Um, the, all the different levels, are you getting the same type of participation? Um, how, how is it? This year we've had a very, we started the year off with a very high number of members in the student council, uh, much higher than we have in past years. We averaged out our first meeting was about 250 to 300 people. And we've, we've kept that number pretty strong. Right now we're still averaging between two and 250 people at each meeting. Um, and definitely this year with holiday drive and turkey run, the, <coughs> the need is much bigger. So it, that having that many people really helps to account for that. That's good, keep that going. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, did you want to make one? Oh, sure. Uh, the, the chair, yeah. this chair has, uh, has invited me to share any updates relative to colleagues that have alerted us that they couldn't be present. Uh, <coughs> the is, uh, the conference. Attorney Hall uh, was in earlier, picking up materials, and has a family obligation, and Mr. Evelyn uh, indicated uh, and, but they certainly wish everyone a very happy Thanksgiving, and uh, I'm reviewing the materials for tonight's meeting on their own. Thank you. Um, 
academic uh, department presentation. We are going to be going to another spot. Uh, the presentation takes place right here. Right here. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's with great pleasure that our math department presents to you tonight. Uh, we have three staff members that are going to go through an introduction themselves. Uh, we have a PowerPoint for you and um, certainly uh, some handouts as well. But we're very proud of this department. Um, they've been pioneering a number of best practices over the years and certainly um, a department for other departments to look up to. So without further ado, I'll let get started. Hi, everyone. I'm Jen Garrison. I am the math team leader. Also, some of you might know me as a, a different role as treasurer of the Teachers Association also. I have a pleasure to work with many of you on uh, that. Um, our uh, department is compromised of nine of us. We have um, four male staff and five uh, female staff. And, oh, and then, and then, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm Jessica, McK Jessica McKenzie. I'm one of the math, team, math department members here. And I'm Jessica Olson, also a math department member. Um, the first thing that we wanted to present was we're very excited about our new <coughs> course pathways that we have. We've um, started a couple new courses, one uh, being that we've added um, Honors Algebra 1 course, which is new, which helps bridge the gap from our Honors Algebra 2 grade 9 students. Um, if they should need a, if they found the course too uh, difficult, they would have had to go down to CP Algebra 1, which upset a lot of parents and students if they went from like, you know, a high level on Honors Algebra 2 down to a CP. So we've now added the Honors Algebra 1, which has made students happy, parents happy. Also, we've, um, we've added Algebra 1, which is for our, our lower level students. In the past, it's been a two-year course where it's Algebra 1 <coughs> Part 1. Then they take Algebra 1 Part 2 junior year in the past, which was after MCAS. Um, throughout the years, we have noticed that we see a, a lot of full course algebra questions on the MCAS, so we decided as a math department that we should really look into this and see what we can do to help, our, to help all students. So that's why we came up with just um, Algebra 1. So now all of our grade 9 students have a full course of um, Algebra 1, which you can't wait to see what that's going to bring for grade 10, since they've all had a full year course. From there, we hope that this helps placing them in grade 10 for honors on geometry and CP geometry. Um, and then our current grade 9 students, what we are going to add in two years is they're going to split up the Algebra 2, which is a much harder course. It's actually almost accelerated at this school because we have a, a week on and a week off. So we're very um, excited um, about that. So our current grade nine students, when they hit grade 11, they'll have algebra two part one, or I shouldn't say or, and for the grade 12, they'll have um, algebra two part two. So that's also what we're um, excited about. So essentially we eliminated the two year course for algebra one, and now it's going to be a two year course at the higher level math, which makes more sense for kids to be more on. Doc, oh, yes. I, I'd like to encourage the school committee to recognize or use the lens here of this uh, reconfiguration and the weight and sophistication of these ma mathematical courses uh, creates great preparation for the 10th grade MCAS. Yes. And, and so you can see uh, there's a dovetail here, okay? The high expectations, a lot of demands, um, but then we're pouncing on the, you know, <coughs> assessing, evaluating, and pouncing on the, this learning. Uh, and it's reflective of the MCAS scores that you need know, to see. And it's directly attributable to the math department and the integration activities that happen as well. So, question? So, question. <clears throat> Maybe it's combined in, in another course these days, but I, I know there's no trig up there. Is, is that part of, a, of one of the other courses, or is trigonometry something that's not? Great, in uh, grade 12. Grade 12. Grade 12, CP functions and trig. Oh, okay. have, have, oh, actually, I uh, forgot about yeah. honors of statistics, too. We are also for next year. Yep. Seniors will have um, the choice of either a health, honors um, statistics, or functions and traits. Okay. Also, when I put this up here, I didn't put the full name because it's very lengthy. All the pre-calculus are pre-calculus slash introduction to trigonometry. Okay. So trigonometry is also in all of the pre-calculus courses. So is there any trade that the students get before they get to calculus? I mean, I see that one on the senior level, but 
do oh. the, the the kids that are on a track to get into calculus. These pre-calculus yeah. classes have trig, and these okay. also have trig in geometry. Okay, thank you. I asked to speak about this slide in particular, being fairly new here to BBT. I was very impressed with the fact that vertical and horizontal alignment, or teaming, is, is such a priority here. Coming from a couple of schools that don't make it a priority, it has such a positive impact on both us as teachers and our students. Um, vertically, we need to make sure that students aren't missing any curriculum from 9th through 12th grade, make sure we're not doing too much any, or any unnecessary overlapping, and we're not missing any subject areas. We meet annually, and we talk about this alignment to see if there's any adjustments that need to be made. And then horizontally, we meet uh, with each other depending on the grade level and the class that we teach. And we have regular meetings. Most of us meet every other week. And we uh, look at assessments. We create them. We revamp them to make sure that our assessments are common. And we also, many of us are doing parallel planning, which means that if somebody has one teacher for Algebra 1 and another teacher for Algebra 1, they're receiving the same instruction, the same content, and it's pretty streamlined. Um, it seems to be working fantastically as a new person. I think it's wonderful. Um, and what did I miss? And just the fact that it's made a priority here is, is very impressive, and I think it makes a big difference. Yes. Along with the teaming um, uh, that you, you've been talking about, being a technical school, is there anything that the mathematics department does with any of the shops to kind of use some of the mathematical principles and in, 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 in programs in the math, academic side, but relate them to the shop environment? So I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> I, I, well, they're going to get to, um, their last slide is uh, about an initiative, a school-wide initiative called Math Problem of the Month, which will come. But um, pretty much all of our shops are utilizing math in some capacity. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's different in health services uh, when they're dealing with CCs and those sorts of measurements versus culinary. Um, so we received a grant two and a half years ago now from the Department of Ed to form integration teams. That team is comprised of a reading specialist or English teacher, a math teacher, and then a shop teacher. They worked together to develop lessons, went in and co-taught those lessons. So that's something that we have been doing for a number of years, but just recently revitalized that. Okay. Um, but the math problem of the month, which is going to come up for you, is done um, in a full integrated way to bring a real world shop application for all students. So, I mean, that's, that's a great way to relate problem solving from the academic it's side the whole, to something. It's like, when am I going to use this? Yeah, exactly. Next period you are. And okay. You know, that kind of thing. This is Jim. This is Jim. Jim. Jerry. 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 Yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is English. English. <laughs> 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 this is English major view. Yeah. The last two principles were not. I promise it won't take more than 20 minutes. <laughs> 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 So uh, we, we, we also found early on that trying to integrate math with 18 different career technical programs was next to an impossibility. And you also had students that were also trying to become college ready at the same time. And so it was hard to drift too far away from, for example, the progressions that they showed you on the previous slide there, serving, you know, if you will, too many masters. And I'll use uh, manufacturing as a good example. Uh, they need trigonometry freshman year. Is perhaps where you were mm -hmm. looking at some of those, saying, where's the trig, and do you have to wait till senior year to get the trig? And the answer is no. Um, the machining teachers, for example, teach what I would call just-in-time trigonometry in a very practical way, in a practical setting. I know Jen, you've helped Mr. Woodward with things like that. Help him refine his teaching techniques. Mr. Woodward is not a math teacher, but he certainly can find an angle when he needs it, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and and has his um, whiteboard right there in their related room close by that they go and they teach their just in time uh, academic topic, if you will, as it's needed in the shop setting, and you can multiply that out throughout uh, the whole building. You know, measurements in culinary, uh, medical math, uh, in health services, etc. Uh, and so what I found that had worked better than trying to integrate say 18 shops into a curriculum progression like that was to give access to in time for collaboration for these folks to go out and work with shop teachers. Part of what that grant was about and others like it uh, was to 
give them opportunities to work together. Say, hey, here's what works well for us in, in teaching trigonometry, for example, uh, to help folks uh, like Mr. Woodward, for example, be better at presenting his concepts when he needs to present them. So you know, it's kind of uh, integration, but going back the other way. So we've tried it in, in both directions and find that it, it works well. Uh, so we also try and incorporate a lot of technology in what we do in the math department. So one of our biggest things is having online textbooks and resources for all of our students. Uh, we were really excited this year because we just got a new pre-calculus textbook. Our old textbook didn't come with an online edition, and this one does. It's actually that image over there on the left um, is our online pre-calculus textbook, and it comes with resources such as online videos the students can access when they're confused, self-check quizzes that are graded online where the students can actually check themselves and see if they are doing things correctly or incorrectly in order to study. Uh, and there's just some really amazing resources on there, including help for us as well with um, test generator tools that allow us to look through giant tool banks of questions to create really good assessments for our students. Um, also, a lot of us have teacher websites. Um, a favorite uh, is Weebly. A lot of us use Weebly sites, and we post our weekly homework there. We post when our tests and quizzes are. Um, some of us also post our notes so that students have access to what we had on the board that day. Um, and I know Justin Sistwick uses Microsoft Teams. That's a newer one that the school is working with, where it's, I'd almost describe it like a Twitter the way it is, where it's stream of conscious and you can post things, but you can post assignments and you can post um, just notes and homework and things like that on it. So it's a really interesting thing. And I should just explain it a little bit more. I use it in lieu of a website. That is my website. The students can access it through their BBT email account and they can get on that way. And there's three primary areas that I use. I'll use a calendar where I can post assignments so they can see past, current, and future assignments. And then for those students that use Apple products, I've been uploading PDFs of everything so they can download it onto their iPad in the class, write notes right on it, do their homework right on it, they show me, they can submit it to me. Um, those people that aren't using Apple products, I've been um, using the class notebook in Microsoft Teams and I can upload the same material there. The neat thing about this is as we're doing notes and doing reviewing homework in class, that is saved in real time up so that the students can con can see it. If they're out for the day, they can look at it while we're doing it, or they can look at it after. So I'm still fairly new to it. I'm still looking to explore a little bit more and use a few other features more regularly, but it's been pretty new. So I'm trying to learn all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Old school. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying. Um, and on top of notes, I actually even will sometimes for my AP Calculus students, because it's a particularly challenging course, even videotape, you can videotape your smart board and send them a video of the actual lesson so that if they're feeling like they're behind, they can catch up that way. Um, another great thing that we have, we are very lucky as a school that we have classroom sets of TI-84 calculators, uh, which is really great for our students to use, and we try and incorporate those into our classes as much as possible. Uh, for standardized test prep, um, MCAS Math Camp was actually new last year. We, uh, we redid it last year. So it wasn't new last year. We had done it for years, but we redid the entire camp to make it 11 different sessions with different topics that show up on the MCAS primarily. And we had different teachers, different days. It ran for, it ran starting in the end of March through May, right up to when the exam was. And so there were two sessions a week, one on Tuesday, one on Thursday each with a specified topic, so students could be a little bit more choosy about, well, I actually don't really understand operations with polynomials, so that's something I really want to go to that session because I'm not sure how to handle this. So it gave students a little bit of um, flexibility in learning what they specifically felt they needed to do. And we were also, as a department, encouraging our students to come as much as possible. Uh, I'm just going to say, I probably should mention that each of us um, took either a Tuesday or a, or a Thursday just to make sure that we all rotated through and it was all voluntarily. So, mm -hmm. just to make sure that everybody got a chance to. So, on top of that, on top of that we also, in our geometry classes, I know a lot of us build a lot of MCATs um, into the curriculum. A lot of us assign shop homework assignments that include MCAS questions in order to help prepare our students for those exams. So it's something that's a year-long process, even with this MCAS campus being an extra support. We have a question over here from Anthony. What 
What type of uh, attendance are, are, are we getting for the math camp? Is, is it just a handful of students? Is it a full classroom? It varies from week to week last year. Based on the topic? Based on, topic. On the topic. Mm -hmm. And do you find it's, it's all ranges of the different class, um, you know, whether it's uh, Algebra 1 or Algebra 2 honors, you, you find you're getting a good range of students that attend? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. <clears throat> We also do offer an SAT prep course uh, in the fall it's for seniors and in the spring it's for the juniors. Uh, that runs for eight weeks. They do a um, practice test in the beginning and then they do a post test at the end. And it's a three hour course where it's split with English. So each student spends an hour and a half on math and then an hour and a half on English and we split the group into two groups and um, swap who they're working with. And then my favorite, my last slide of the night, <laughs> um, our math problem of the month. Um, I don't know, I've been here quite a while and I can't recall a year without math problem um, of the month that, that uh, Doc helps us with. Um, it, it's a Valley Tech tradition. Um, students, um, actually I have a, and I have one. Not I don't have enough answer. copies, but if you wanted to take a <laughs> peek at what it is, it's... I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> 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 Give them more. <laughs> Give them more time or sign yeah. them up. Sign them up for the health session. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff don't want to take it. I'm going to get my TI-30. Students um, complete the math problem of the month um, in their math classes and all correct answers go into a, a raffle. And the raffle is chosen every month with dog and they are um, awarded $50 in ones. <laughs> we haven't think. gone to the change yet. <laughs> <laughs> the students think they've like won the lottery. Um, in order to showcase that, I actually did a um, bulletin board in the math wing so kids can get excited about you know if they won and, and to get excited about the next month also. So I'm very proud of that. Um, any questions? Yeah. I got a hypothetical question. Um, you had mentioned that uh, meeting uh, and to look at curriculum. Um, and then every other week you meet to see where we, where you at, what's your, your learning tendencies, what's happening, and so forth. Um, have you had the experience where those things have got out of sync? So that you know you have one group of students that are way ahead of another group of students and you're not, and if you're out of sync, how do you get back in sync? My short time I've been here, I haven't, but I don't know. Typically, we, we all seem to be on the same That's amazing. track. Yeah. That's great. I, because I think we touch base so often, and, we, and we, all, we all work well as a unit. So the frequency of the meetings help to, uh, to make keep, sure them, that we're all keep everybody on the same general right. path. Correct. Okay, because I've been uh, hearing from other systems that, I've, that I know uh, that they get way out of bounds with each other. Yeah, and in um, some cases, they, they end up at the end of the year where they should have taught, you know, up to page 97 and they're only up to page 46. Right. Something of that nature. They get out of whack. So the, the frequency of the meetings help to uh, precursor that so that it doesn't take place. Definitely. Is that but pretty much how it works? It's formal and informal, and I think maybe a like two to three days we've been off, but that's all I've That's about it. Okay. We try and test around similar times, and oh, that yes. keeps it on track for us, too, because since we have those common assessments, we have these benchmarks we gotcha. have to meet. Gotcha. So testing helps as another spoke in the wheel on that as well. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate that. That, that would be my observation. The, the regular assessments that are from the get-go, from even before the students say, are, are not part of the admissions process, but they're part of uh, positioning students and to build upon their skill set. Okay. They have the benefit of that research to make adjustments rather than be surprised. Right, right, right. So they're in sync. One other aspect of that is, from Curtis, is how we secure Title IIa money, which is for teacher quality, and that gives us funds for substitutes so the departments are able to meet during the school day as a whole. They lock themselves in a conference room and kind of battle it out over curriculum and things as needed. Mm -hmm. and we try and do that two or three times a day when they have a solid six hours to get oh, through that. Yeah. So that's something they do in addition to their regular meeting time. Great. There's three helpful. good remedies right there. Yep. Yeah. These can help. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, okay, we're at now uh, yeah. number seven, facilities subcommittee. John Lavin. Yeah. Yes, uh, the facilities subcommittee met last night. And, you know, a nice update of what's going on. Uh, the scoreboard okay. on the football field. The, the sign for Unibank is now in auto body. It's being painted and ready to be assembled shortly. But they're not going to do anything until, you know, have a, you know, a dedication to the sign, Unibank, until the beaver is done for the top. And they're working on that right now. As soon as that's done and everything's assembled, Doc will set up a, a time for Unibank to come down and speak about the sign Doc. I don't know if you want to. Sure, we, we communicated with Unibank uh, dignitary. And, and the preference was to wait until uh, uh, the students had done some finishing work. Uh, uh, yeah, the yeah, and that um, the, the teachers wanted to maximize the learning potential of the student involvement. We respect that. We're not a production shop. Okay, and so when we felt it was a more finished state, uh, then uh, then we did the so-called ribbon cutting. Okay. Right. Um, so, uh, and the Unibank people had indicated they had no problem with that. Okay, we have to courtesy of the response back then. That's a good thing. And any questions on that before I? Well, no, no, just okay. The second one is uh, the front sign. I don't know if anybody's noticed, but the cones are out there. We, I think they were supposed to pour concrete today, but I don't think it happened yeah. due to the weather. But the forms are going to get poured. Everything's going along, and hopefully by the middle of December, if weather permitting, we'll stop blocking. And by spring, we should be having a full sign up there. And. Also, the other was, uh, again, the committee is, you know, proactive about things in the building, and we had, you know, asked Mr. Brochu to have somebody come in and look at our roof, and they did a complete walkthrough of the whole roof, and uh, they found a few places in the 300 wing, which we haven't done, the, you know, the upgrade on yet, and repaired it, and it was like a $1,900 fix was the best investment, I think, to save, you know, the roof, and they checked even the stuff that's uh, already been done, which is part of the warranty package. If you saw how it was done, we need to make sure we have a preventive maintenance program to make sure that our roofs last longer than, you know, if we don't watch what we're doing, of course, it'll dilapidate. Mm -hmm. So, and it's also part of the uh, material supplier's uh, warranty that we do have a, a preventive maintenance program to check. So it was really worth the $1,900 to have them, and they did find some seams that were loose, and they repaired them. That was part of the whole cost, so I think it was a great, great thing. Any, yes, yeah. Kind of, kind of building on that, over the past couple of years, we've had to do some some larger projects with the, the field and, and, and the roof project. It would be good for, for my own understanding, maybe for the committees, if one of these at one of our committee meetings uh, in the future. If maybe we could have a, a look forward as to do we have an estimate or um, an evaluation of maybe some of the bigger facilities projects that might be looming out there may not be right now but you know maybe in two years we need to do something with parking lots or plumbing or something like that but it would be good just to have that kind of a brief to the committee that is there anything in the in the next you know three or four years that we'll be looking at down the road with having to, to do some more extensive work. Okay, I'll wait there. Yeah, good point. Yes. And uh, let's see what else was there. <clears throat> if I may, I think the parking lot was one that they had talked about, I think, a year or so ago, yeah, right? Mm -hmm. so you, yeah, I just used that as yeah, a No, I understand, but we sealed, but you're right. There, yeah. there, there's something that we just basically sealed when we haven't yeah. really gone into repair the whole thing right. yet. So yeah. it's a good point. Yeah. Because that's going to come the roof someday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and the other one we just we talked about, I think you all have an email about the uh, carpentry has now a new outside building now. You know, like the Quonset Hut type thing to store all their lumber and material for their outside building project. And they're in the process of erecting it right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. It's like a pre patch center. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Construction technology. Does anybody uh, who was on the committee have anything else? <laughs> <laughs> anything else, sir? No, I think that's it, unless there's any other questions. <coughs> any other questions for anybody? Yeah. Yeah.
Hearing seeing none, let's move it on. Okay. Uh, Assistant Superintendent like Curtis. Uh, thank you. Uh, so on the agenda tonight, we're going to be looking at the END certification status and a vote um, of that uh, END that's been certified. So if we'll turn to item 8.1. Uh, this came in from the Department of Revenue, as I had mentioned uh, at the last meeting. We were prioritized a little bit below the cities and towns because of their tax rates. Uh, we did get it at just a few days later. And two key numbers you probably want to look at are the amount that you are allowed to be certified and maintain in the district without giving any funds back to our member towns, which we're not there yet. And it's 5% of the FY18 budget, the budget that we're in now, which was $1.1 million. Um, that's the amount you're allowed to have uh, in your coffers uh, in terms of END. <coughs> we actually certified in at $657,999. So it was roughly half of that amount. Um, I think everybody gets a copy of this at this point, right? Um, so with that said, uh, we would like as we usually do on, upon certification, is to make the transfer of a sum of money uh, over to our capital projects fund. <coughs> and if you'll turn to item 8.2, you'll see there's a blue sheet there with a motion on it. And we pull the information right out of our budget book. It gives us the authorization to spend, or I should say, to transfer up to a half a million dollars. This is part of the budget book that is approved by the towns. Um, and this allows us to uh, accomplish many needed capital projects throughout the year uh, that we otherwise wouldn't be able to afford. Um, so with that said, I've given you a recap at the bottom of uh, the amount that was certified at 657999 and a vote of 250000 is what we're seeking, which will leave us uh, just under $408,000 remaining that can be voted for other purposes. I'll remind the committee that traditionally uh, we have uh, offered some of this and usually up to $250,000 as a direct offset to member assessments. So at a very minimum, we will likely be bringing that as a motion as part of the budget to vote another $250,000 of the four hundred and seven dollars remaining. All right, that will be a direct offset in terms of uh, the member assessments. Uh, so with that, I'll make the motion, Chris. Second. We have a motion. We get a second from John. Do you want to read it? Or we all set? Yeah. Everybody has a copy in front of that. So it'll be set with yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Ye
of roughly 50% of what is eligible or allow, allowable. Uh, is that the lowest we've ever been uh, in terms of uh, in your recent memory here? I don't need to go back. How it it is. It seems is. to me that, that that feels like it's fairly low relative. I usually had a pretty good comfort level. It's more like two-thirds of the total. Yeah, we've this been, seems more like a 50 percent, so it seems like we're down about a quarter of a percent. Yeah, we've been in the eights and the nines. And right. Yeah. 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 Okay. So this is indeed, uh, my senses are right, this is actually, um, and it's good you spoke on it because I was going to bring it up as a question, uh, it is something that is less than we've ever had before. Is that fair? It is. Okay. But one of the reasons, Glenn, Mr. Chairman, is it's, it's less of residue is because the district, at, with the support of the school committee, has self-funded its roof repair project. Uh -huh. Okay, so we've dipped into our reserve to do that rather than ask the towns to enter into more debt to do it. Yeah. Okay. As a cost it result in, that's right. It's yeah. a direct result of fewer reserves. Yeah. yeah. And okay. we have another question? Yes, I think. I'm just looking at the uh, the E and D calculation and one of the one of the categories here is other receivable or drawn accounts and deficits. And I, if, if if there are uh, a few of the accounts here that are overdrawn and just that should be something we look pretty closely at as we put the budget together for next year and figure out why those accounts are overdrawn maybe we're purchasing something now that we thought we needed next year but but we ended up needing it now but whatever the reason is for that over overdrawn account yeah. if I may. Yeah. Well, we, we, um, we recognize that uh, and, and what the committee witnesses as a trust we recognize as we get closer to the fiscal year kind of the you know, April, May, June kind of mm -hmm. thing, that the, the business office offers line item amendment changes yeah. to, to address. And, and there's nothing here that, that's really egregious. And no, so. it, it, it's all. It's, it's a caution. It, it, and, okay. it, and it uses a tool for subsequent yeah. planning. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We look at that. Um, I guess the, the, in the municipal level, they, they usually underfund snow and ice <laughs> removal, you know, kind of thing, because they know they have more flexibility with that. Uh, some of the changes are driven by needs identified to students that weren't mm -hmm. here previously. And so the Curtis receives, uh, the business office receives, requests to redirect. Uh, yeah. and, and, and so that drives a change that wasn't known at the time of the budget. Mm -hmm. right. But but we do use that yeah. process just to, and always present the rationales uh, for line item changes to be authorized by the school committee. So let me offer another piece for that. What you're looking at at the upper section is revolving funds and only the copy center is in a deficit. Okay. And we are, we've been in the Yeah, I know, it's a mix of accounts, right? Everything else is a receivable. Okay. And they can't count that towards your E&D because if for some reason you didn't collect it, they would need to make sure that it was there. So once it is collected, it'll then fall out next year. All right? Yep. But at least know that only one of those was in a deficit. Got it. Yeah. Thanks. The other thing, uh, and that's, that's a good point. That's uh, a good point. If I may. Uh, we've also met and reviewed the copy center practices uh, to strengthen uh, the way in which certain things have been handled mm -hmm. for printing. Uh, okay. All done in good faith, yeah. sometimes to help some of our member school systems and municipalities strengthening <coughs> the whole process. For, uh, okay, good. thank you. Retrievable. You good, Anthony? Good. Okay, any other questions? And seeing none, I'll, I'll call for a vote on item 8.2. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Those that wish to abstain? The ayes have it. Okay, and item 8.3 is a donation of HVAC supplies from Peter Beauregard. We had a similar uh, donation in the prior year. I'm just looking for a motion to accept the donation. We have a motion, we have a second. Um, any, any conversation on this? Any? Uh, just a minute. Yes. Instructors are okay with what they received? Yes, this came directly from them. Okay. So I just want to make sure very useful for the In terms of the, of the items or yes, of the total? The items. Of oh, the items? Yeah. Correct. You know, just sometimes generally stuff comes yeah. in and they it goes, it shows up on their doorstep and they're not happy with it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have a uh, motion. We have a second. We have a conversation. Any other conversation on this? If you see none, I'll call for a vote. We're to say aye. 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 Uh, oppose? Abstain? So moved. Thank you. Okay, and the, the last item, uh, Anthony, you had uh, raised a question concerning the grants and really uh, from a goal perspective, what would we be looking at, number, yep. a number of grants or a dollar value? 
And so uh, Dr. Fitzpatrick actually um, generated, a, a, through his experience with grants, a, um, a, a nice little chart here um, that kind of shows <coughs> the steps that you go through from a flow chart perspective uh, to research and identify grants. So mm -hmm. if you'll just take a, a look down that. Doc, you might want to step in and add anything you want to. And how that proceeds to the pre-application phase and what Doc terms a feasibility study where you're meeting with various people, people of the leadership team um, to determine the suitability of the grant. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the rationale uh, for the building phase and writing and design phase and then finally the implementation. Um, this does not come without a great deal of resources behind it, meeting with people uh, to determine what those needs are. For instance, you focus possibly on capital projects um, to determine whether or not there are grants out there that can meet that need. We're looking at some, you know, uh, related to security. Uh, obviously, MSBA might be for the root for that last section, which I think we have around 350000 that we parlayed after each renovation that we've done to those roofs. Um, but it is a carefully thought out process. Uh, I would say that um, the biggest piece of this is the amount of information that comes in. And I'd say Dr. Fitzpatrick is one of the uh, main contributors to what I receive in terms of grant opportunities. Then I'm charged with going and meeting with various constituents to determine whether or not the grant, if we could even apply for it. Um, a good example that we just had was on the Wi-Fi grant and did extensive meetings with uh, Rosetta and Erin, uh, who is her network specialist. And as hard as we tried to get that grant, in terms of justifying applying for it, there was just nothing that we needed aside from a one-to-one -one initiative uh, that we could have put in there from a network infrastructure perspective. So we go through those processes and determine whether or not we can move to that very next phase. Um, in terms of priority, I would say our first would be to protect the entitlement grants, which we roughly bring in about a half a million or more dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, those are uh, items, I wouldn't say they're free, but they're given to you by the state and you do have to apply for them and you have to meet the criteria behind the grant in order to receive it. And then you have to also monitor it, do the report out on it, uh, and, and provide backup for the supporting expenditures. Um, uh, another quick example, too, we just uh, had a, I think it was Bridges uh, to College uh, grant. There were three recipients that were going to be given funds. We had about $267,000. Um, and it had to tie into post-secondary, uh, obviously, and we went through extensive, I think I probably put about three and a half days worth of work into that. You'll see on the uh, additional handout I have here, when you're looking at the potential of getting that, and I think I uh, just received word that 30 applicants applied for it, and there's going to be three awards. It's, it, the likelihood of getting it is, is probably not great. But we put our best foot forward, yeah. put the time in, um, and we keep our fingers crossed that our proposal is outstanding. So, so you know, earlier in the committee meeting, we had a presentation by, by the math department, and um, we were told about the teaming and how um, Jennifer Garrison would have has time uh, within her department uh, so they can shut the door, go over curriculum, and, and kind of brainstorm on new ideas. In that type of scenario, does would Jennifer have you know this type of information so that whether it's her or any other departments, we can keep the grant engine going and maybe for some of the smaller things that are directly applicable to their departments. Um, not saying they spend a lot of time on this, but it, it could be something that, you know, if, would Jennifer be able to Yes obtain grants and, and maybe find things that are in line with her goals for the department and then go through this process and kind of work at the more the more local, maybe the smaller grants that that your staff might not look directly into because they may not be big dollars. 
We do that now. Okay. Uh, the Ed Foundation, uh, we send those out to all the instructors. Okay. I also have instructors that send me information. Can we apply for this grant? When they do that, that just triggers a joint meeting between okay, the two of us to determine whether or not we should pursue it. Uh, because you have to get into the specifics mm -hmm. of what the grant requirements yep. are okay. to determine whether or not we could even apply. But, uh, so. but they are empowered to, to be able to do that and they are engaging they and, and, and offering ideas and, and, uh, and possibilities, right? Yes, and then okay. I get it and I read it over and, and from my perspective make any changes that I feel like are necessary to, mm -hmm. you know, or to shine a little bit more. Because I know a lot of times people are just <coughs> a shell of, of uh, the data they're trying to present or the narrative mm -hmm. and then they leave it up to me to then go back and kind of reconstruct. Okay. So yes, we do do that and encourage it because those things, as, as we say, even in, in this item 8.5 here, it's a two page document, that a lot of these smaller grants can be very time consuming. Um, so, and the report out requirements can be time consuming as well and can last three and sometimes five years. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to really go through the process of determining, is that amount of money uh, was, is it worth the effort that it takes on the back end, um, you know, to, after you've applied? Mm -hmm. um, so I think from, I want to point out a couple of things on this uh, page that we presented at our administrator retreat and just things to think about and to make sure that this is aligned with our, our mission and our goals. Um, and do we actually have that obligation to continue it after it's done. We had gotten a, a, a grant through uh, one of our funders for our um, transition room, and they gave it to us for three years, $60,000 a year, and that was Metro West Health Foundation, mm -hmm. and we were required to bring that into our budget. Well, on the front end of that, um, it obviously is a great deal, but if you're not able to incorporate that into your operations, then you're failing the grant requirement. Mm -hmm. So right. you always have to make sure, and you never know where you're gonna be at three years from now. I mean, if y'all have seen that our unreserved fund balance of certified is coming down, we really need to start thinking about that 250 we, we are allotting back to our pounds. Is that sustainable if that continues to shrink? Because as you know, when that pops over and has to be funded, you don't have to have an expenditure increase. They're just having to now um, I guess come up with that 250,000 collectively um, and it raises their assessment percentage. So it's all about planning down the road and how some of this stuff might um, actually uh, affect our operation. Um, and I think we went over the bottom is the amount of effort required to complete the application and follow up on the reporting requirements because some of these grants, they are very small and they do have interesting reporting requirements because they're, they're, they're trying to gather data and see is what you did something that can be replicated in another system um, and does it provide meaningful data. And then I think on the other side, uh, this is just something I hope uh, everybody will take a, a, a second to look at again. This is what we discussed at our administrative retreat to see some of the considerations we go through or should be going through as we're making decisions to apply for grants. Um, I'll, I'll say from a reality perspective, um, I am reacting most of the time. It's very, it's very, very difficult to pre-plan. I can do that on the entitlement grants because I've got time when the summer is starting. Uh, but as it gets uh, further into the year and you get the last of these uh, grant opportunities coming at you, it is difficult uh, to do anything other than respond to a deadline. You are conducting meetings along the way to try to gather data, but until that uh, report is due, other priorities can find a way to sneak in. Um, so that's just a quick overview of you know what, how we view the grant process here. Uh, we do believe protecting the entitlements is paramount. I think we get around $100,000 or so in other competitive private grants. That's also important. Um, and then for the other state grants that drive an MSBA project, that can be a half million dollars in the mass skills capital. Those are also very important, but they are very much driven by uh, the state and our need at that point, especially on a roof project. Uh, as you know, we have to come up with 100% of those funds, even though we're reimbursed 
that roughly just say 50%. Mm -hmm. um, but if we don't have that, we can't even apply. So we go through great pains trying to transfer monies to come up with that until we get the reimbursements, and then we pay back our other capital projects. Uh, it's an interesting um, um, you know, set of journal entries that has to take place, but we have to show that we are capable of funding. Much like the receivables that we get hit for, uh, if something were to happen to the MSB and the money was not there, we would have to fund it. That's why they want to make absolutely certain you've got it in-house. Um, but we've never been failed by the state on an MSBA project, so the likelihood of that happening is probably new. But, okay. you know, that's another pot between three and 500000 that um, as the need arises or as the grant opportunities are there, we can apply for. Okay, Anthony? Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Good job on that, because I've been through it with uh, the partnership fund <clears throat> with uh, Carpenters Union, that I'm no longer involved. But um, it's the follow-up, it's the paperwork, it's the uh, making sure that everything's done. So you say you have $60,000, but then if things don't fall in line, you don't have $60,000, you only get $30,000. And then it has a lot to do with uh, work opportunities and guaranteed employment. Like a bunch of these grants, they're like, they want you to guarantee that there's gonna be a job at the end of it. And we can't do that. We can't right. say, you are gonna get a job when you get the grant, you know? So we've been through that a lot too. We did a really good job on that. And it's, it's very cumbersome, the paperwork, especially at the end, to make sure that you hit all the goals that they wanted you to have, so. Thank you. Yep, no problem. And then in your package, one line, uh, final thing is a budget report. And if you just flip uh, to the very back page, I wanted to bring to your attention that at this point out of our budget, we've got about $3 million remaining that is uh, not encumbered in the form of salaries, purchase orders, or through actual expenditures. And that's about 13.25% of the budget that remains at this point. And again, keep in mind, salaries are a huge piece of that because it shows the full encumbrance there. That will eventually just get paid out on its own. It's already been provided for. Um, but it lets you know it's it's uh, it's not a ton of money that remains, and we're we're just about to, you know, hit the, the end of November, and we've got several months left. But um, it will eventually go down. I just want to at least point that out to you and let you know where we stood here today. Okay. Thanks, Curtis. Thank you. Thanks, Curtis. Thanks. All right. Oh right. uh, yeah. Well, so with that, let's go. Uh, Anthony Steele, please. Assistant Superintendent Director of the Board. Vice Chairman, if it's okay with you and the committee, uh, Mrs. Swayze, you'd like to join us? Okay, you, sir. Okay. okay. I'd rather have Mrs. Swayze. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, but if we have to have you, it's okay. Oh, there's only Did one chair. I'm not going to be you. No, Jerry. Left turn from the back row. The funny you saw all this time already. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Swayze. My pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Finn. Hi, everyone. Everyone, welcome. Um, many of the items I have tonight uh, have to do uh, with Mr. Swayze's uh, areas and uh, areas of expertise as well. So. Um, Appropriate that she was already here at the meeting. Uh, she can join me up here for some of the presentations. Uh, the first uh, item up, 9.1, is the Abigail Adams Award Ceremony. This is, as many of you uh, are aware, a state scholarship opportunity. Uh, it's awarded to our top uh, performing MCAS uh, achievers. Uh, it is essentially a scholarship for free tuition for the recipients to a four-year four uh, degree program. It does not cover room and board or tax, but it does cover tuition for four years, providing they maintain their GPA. Uh, this year, uh, we awarded 75 of our students the Abigail Adams Award. 
uh, we just have had recently had a ceremony to uh, give that to them. That was uh, somewhat of a surprise. And uh, we do take uh, our annual photo, somewhat creative uh, opportunity there. Sometimes you'll, you'll remember this from annual reports and things of that nature. Saw it on the website. Uh, it, this year we did three exclamation points uh, <laughs> as, as photographed from the ceiling of the competition center. So I have not seen the photo yet. Uh, it looked like three exclamation points. Yeah. It look, looks good. <laughs> it does feature myself, Doc, and Miss Swayze, and uh, I think I believe the dots of those exclamation points. I look like Long Commerce. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyhow, uh, a nice achievement for our students. It's been consistent. Uh, basically, it's the top 25% of the class, correct? Uh, and so that, that number has been fairly consistent. Uh, it's right, right around 75 uh, as the class size uh, grows. If there are ties, uh, the state boards on the favorable side of that. I think the high one of our is the 82, 83 right. uh, one year. Uh, but 75 is a, a, a product of 25% of the current class, their highest achievers. Right, so nice, nice job by them. Any questions on 9.1? Seeing none. Uh, the second item here, 9.2, the National Society, uh, oh, sorry, National Honor Society induction. Uh, was just last night. We also had an induction ceremony at that time for the National Technical Honor Society. Um, we have a total of 96 members at this point in time. Uh, 112 applied this year and 70 were accepted. That is a rather rigorous uh, application process. Some of the changes this year uh, did increase rigor. Uh, one of them was the submission of an electronic portfolio. Uh, that was a new, new uh, advent there. Um, as well as we had raised, uh, you all voted as a committee, we raised the GPA to 96 uh, average GPA, uh, which uh, obviously does indeed raise the bar for acceptance into it. Nonetheless, we still had 112 students who were made those initial qualifications and again went on from there uh, to submit portfolios. Uh, nice event attended by, well, let's see, we had a couple hundred in the audience. Uh, we have our returning members and, of course, the new inductees. Uh, all were honored and we celebrated the uh, pillars of uh, the standards, essentially, of the NHS and NTHS. Uh, those uh, both societies are uh, led by uh, Ms. Moynihan and Ms. Mnugin, uh, and they, they do a fine job. They've done a fine job now for several years for us with both of those organizations, as well as a faculty council uh, that consists of seven uh, faculty members who volunteer their time. Each of those 120 <coughs> portfolios is reviewed seven times by each faculty member. So they spend a considerable amount of time uh, reviewing student work and, and evaluating criteria. Quite a process. When those students do eventually gain membership, and furthermore to maintain membership, because they will be asked to leave if they don't keep with the expectations, um, it's quite significant. Uh, very significant community service uh, expectation, between 20 to 25 hours in the summer. <coughs> 10 to 15 hours uh, per term per trimester. It's uh, quite an expectation on them from all, all fronts, from scholarship to community service, and uh, et cetera. Anything you'd add to that? Sure. Doc? Yeah, as outlined, uh, the, uh, this is, uh, the Honor Society is a very challenging, stringent requirement, and it is conceivable that, that one or more constituent might not be happy that a son or daughter, grandson or granddaughter, uh, didn't make this particular round. All right, we, we create multiple opportunities to be successful. We would encourage anyone to try again, benefit from the experience. So um, we, we, it wouldn't be a surprise to us for you to encounter someone, uh, given the interest in being part of the organization, for somebody who didn't meet the standards set by the policy and by the guidelines. Uh, but we certainly would encourage them to, you know, Learn from the experience and try again. Do anything we can to be helpful, improve their chances. Uh, it's so juniors and seniors? Yes, it is juniors and seniors. Yeah, one, one thing that's interesting to keep in mind is that 
as I uh, even entertain or as part of the process I am you come to see for an appeal for admissions and things like that. And I look at the criteria and I look at the students and uh, it does dawn on you that um, we essentially have 1,225 really great students here. Mm. And so these are the students who are trying to distinguish themselves as the you know, best of the best. And what does that mean? And so you know, you can look at any one individual student and say, oh, come on, she's they're great. You know, look at this kid who wouldn't want to be this kid or have this student. Um, and then when you, you realize the, uh, the job of the faculty council is to look at all of them. I didn't read all 112 applications and, and try to apply some standard of consistency to it. Uh, and you have to have an appreciation for that. Um, essentially, they want to let them all in, but they are also very adherent to the standards of the NHS and the NTHS and what those mean. Even students following directions that you know, the, the uh, students who, who ultimately wish to be recognized and wear the stole uh, are not the ones that you remind to go to meetings or remind them that they have to do community service or so on and so forth. They're part of it is the personal responsibility and so forth. So uh, they really do have high expectations on them. And, and you kind of contextualize it and realize it in that sense. Uh, of what it means to be the best of the best, or the, the elite of the elite at, at Valley Tech, it's quite a distinction to, to earn and keep. It's impressive. Okay, um, 9.3, Vocational Career and Curriculum Night. Uh, we're actually underway right now. Uh, it's the uh, presentation you hear going on in the room next to us uh, when I stuck out a few moments ago. I went to go check on a couple of my shops. Uh, when I say my shops, we, the administrative team, uh, broke up all 18 shops, so that we each took a couple uh, for the purpose of coaching. I'm uh, working uh, closely one-on-one -on -one with, uh, referred to us uh, as our liaisons, we're liaisons to those shops, but uh, setting up panels. Uh, what career, the book career night that is about is essentially the freshman students are uh, in the sixth of seven exploratories, and they're about to make a very big decision uh, at the end of that process as to what shop uh, they wish to pursue for the next four years. Uh, this is an opportunity, it's a, an evening that we added, uh, much like we have Parents' Night, uh, which became Academic Curriculum Night. Uh, as you recall, we negotiated an extra night with uh, staff, an evening with staff, and this was how we decided to best spend it with our parents' input. This is an opportunity tonight for the, particularly the vocational staff, uh, to meet with these parents, the freshman uh, parents, with, again, their sons and daughters in the sixth of seven exploratories, to talk about what their career area has to offer. They have panels set up in each of the shop consisting of not only the instructors, current students, graduates or alums, and business owners. Sometimes an intersect of both. You might have some alums who are business owners. Uh, who are there to represent industry and talk about uh, career offerings and, and uh, things of that nature. We dovetail this with uh, substantially upgrading uh, the shop profiles on our website so that parents could uh, have more takeaway data on expected salary ranges, job projections, uh, all of that type of career information so that they can essentially have uh, an enhanced conversation with their son or daughter about making a, a very large decision about what career to pursue, at least what career to train in for the next four years here. So uh, this is uh, the second year we've done this. It was um, substantially modified this year uh, based on parent uh, feedback and parent input. I promised the parents tonight uh, when I, I greeted them that we would likewise surveying them again to see how it went and what kinds of you know, considerations and modifications we might make to continue to improve and refine the evening. At the same time this is going on, uh, as you know we have more than one instructor in the shop, uh, we are also receiving uh, parents of 10th, 11th, and 12th graders to talk about what the curriculum uh, is in the shop for the remaining three years. So any of the 10th, 11th, and 12th grade parents are welcome to come in on this evening as well. They're not going through the presentation of what the career has to offer. They've already 
Uh, bought the cow. Okay. <laughs> this is what to expect, uh, you know, with, with the shop for the next three years. What to study, when to do it, when would we be looking at things like co-op, when would be the time to start looking at colleges, programs, partnerships with employers, things of that nature. So it's the Voc Curriculum Night, and it's also the Vocational Career Night. That's the, the name uh, we, we gave it. Um, so far, so good. It was, that's why I snuck out again. We were all kind of eager and anxious to uh, see how it's going, uh, trying to uh, again, do the best job we can for our parents and our students to make those decisions. And yes, it may be early to tell, and of course it's obviously an evening of inclement weather, but does it appear to be the parents of the ninth graders are in greater attendance than the other grades given? Or a little bit tricky to tell. I'll tell you why. We, we had an opening uh, session with the ninth grade parents. 10th, 11th, and 12th grade parents were just simply to come in and report to the shop. So they never gathered in, in, in mass, per se. Um, at this point, I would assure you there's more freshman parents here than anything. Uh, they have the most, most to, to uh, achieve tonight, I guess you could say. You're right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Lawrence Wood. Uh, performance award verification uh, is a vote. Before we go to the vote, obviously, we want to provide you with some information first. Uh, we handed out uh, two pieces of paper to you. Uh, the first is performance award uh, program data, uh, and the second was a color spreadsheet uh, consisting of the COP performance attainments. Um, this is particularly, uh, Becky helped pull some of this data together. Uh, perhaps it would help if I remind you of the performance award criteria, and Becky can help uh, by highlighting the achievement of said criteria. Uh, so the, the uh, just to remind you, this is every three years. This is for the 2014 to 17 cycle. Uh, and the attainment of it translates to a 0.75 uh, performance bonus for our staff. Uh, and that's, that's all all staff across the board. Uh, it <coughs> is dependent on the following conditions being met. First, uh, pertains to a four-year graduation rate, uh, sometimes referred to as completion rate, uh, and essentially uh, focuses on the class of 2017. Um, Mrs. Swayze, you can tell sure. a little bit about that. Uh, so for the first criteria, the, the state sets a standard for all schools in which they need to meet for their graduation requirement. Um, and the state target was that was given to Valley Tech was 80% graduation rate, uh, which we then far exceeded. As you can see, um, the BBT class of 2014 was a graduation rate of 98.5. The class of 2015 was a graduation rate of 98.9. The class of 2016 was a graduation of 99.3. And last year's class was 100% graduation. Um, what I want to point out to you is that uh, when you first look at this data, you might ask, well, why is it at 98 and 99, and what happened to the 100%? Um, the less the 100% represents a withdrawal of a student from the class in which they don't indicate where they're going. So they might be moving, they might be relocating as, with their family, um, but the withdrawal is to another educational setting um, during that attrition process. Um, so that's the, the first criteria that we have to look at as far as the, the bonus. Just a question for me. If yeah. it from the state target of the eighty percent, what what criteria do they use to come up with eighty percent when we're frankly almost twenty points higher than that almost all the time? Which seemed to me if I was setting that target, I might want to maybe make it a little smaller, make it a little more difficult to hit. Um, what's the rationale behind there that eighty percent? Is that based on all uh, all schools? Right. So for example, I think if you were to look at all of the public schools across the Commonwealth. There are schools, particularly urban schools or gateway city schools that significantly struggle with attendance and then graduation rate students drop out. They, they go to work for their families, et cetera. Um, there have been years past where we've been given a target of 85, as high as 85, but I think when they comparatively, comparatively look at the whole of the context, um, there are some schools that significantly struggle in the urban areas to recruit. Yeah. So, yeah. and for future reference, if we chose to change that to some other demographic, then it'd be more uh, adjusted to what it is that we're used to. 
it would be more realistic in terms of being able to put it to a lift the bar as opposed to just shoot it in the air hope the ducks fly by. Right? So um, <laughs> you actually raise a very good point. It's like an animal husbandry program. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly Terry and I, you know, have a lot of plenty of animal analogies to go around. Um, uh, one thing that, that is Remind, remind it uh, each time we do this is that you have to be aware of contract language that uh, is essentially three years old uh, when you go to analyze, right? Uh, and, and it's that because we obviously re re-examine the language on negotiation cycles. And that's expected. In fact, Michael already uh, brought that to my attention and say, you know, we should take some notes uh, as we always do this time around to see what maybe we want to change for the next time. Um, Let's, let's look at that language carefully. It says that we have met the DESC state target for accountability, 80%. So as you said, it's shooting fish in a barrel. Uh, it's not, not very challenging. Uh, but let's look at the rest of it. It says, or has improved over the comparable four-year graduation rate for the class of 2014. Now that is actually impossible. 100%. Where are we going, Jerry? 101, 102, we can't do that. So. We have to be careful in both directions yep. that we create a, an incentive target, but not an impossible number, right. and not one that is ridiculously low either. Right. Uh, so there, there's one example of a criterion that we're going to have to examine how we want to rewrite that. Yeah. Right. Uh, so it achieves a lofty goal, but not an unreasonable right. Uh, Good observation. The next one uh, here, uh, oh, just before I move on, I will note that that says or, right? And the or is important. As you know, in, in, in legal, <coughs> ors and ands have a, a hugely different meaning. Uh, and so, you know, the or would be the 80%, right? So what if we didn't improve? Uh, it would go back to the, well, we met the 80%, right? right? So we want to watch our ors and ands. Yep, what it's great. Uh, moving on to the second one. Uh, on the 2017 AYP report, uh, that clearly we would want to make sure that we have met our adequate yearly progress. Uh, and those are targets uh, that Ms. Swayze talked about recently in her MCAS report for English, Math, and Science. Uh, what's interesting is that AYP at this point is now an antiquated term. Uh, that, that if you recall back when we had those trend lines that were pointing up to uh, a very futuristic year of you know, 2014, 2016, and we're beyond that now. And now we're looking at things in terms of uh, SGP, uh, student growth percentiles and things of that nature. So we're going to have a language change uh, mm -hmm. around this. But nonetheless, would you talk about sure. AYP and SGP? Sure. So AYP essentially represents a school's performance and participation. So essentially, your, your students are all participating in the test and they are performing at a high level for you. And schools are awarded for those for the separate criteria coming up with an AYP number. Um, what the new focus has been on is on the individual student's growth percentile. And so as MCAS has been a part of a student's e educational career from early on in the elementary years, the state is able to track a student's growth over time. Um, so from one MCAS test in the third grade to the fifth grade to the eighth grade <coughs> and then to high school. Um, and so with that being said, the state has set student growth percentiles um, that targets for all of the schools in Massachusetts. For the English, we were given a state target of 51% growth, in which we surpassed that our students average out at 70% growth. In mathematics, the state likewise kept uh, gave us a state target of 51% growth, and then we exceeded that as well with 68.5% growth. Um, the last criteria, science, does not have an SGP just yet because it's the newest exam and there's not enough data on that yet to determine a student's growth over time. They don't take a formalized um, science assessment for MCAS until later on in their middle school years. Um, so the state sets those targets for us and then we obviously work to achieve um, those targets and then surpass them, which we have um, mm -hmm. probably done. I'm also not certain because of the multidiscipline aspect of science. So, for example, a student could have taken life science, say biology, uh, in a lower grade, and be taking uh, chemistry or physics or physical science or something in, in, in high school, and there may be a, an inability to calculate a growth percentile because of that. Literally, the apples and orange type scenario. Uh, 
Uh, so it, it remains to be seen if we're ever going to have an SGP in science. So once again, more things to consider. Uh, I think as we know from our MCAS scores, they really don't get much better. Um, so uh, I'd be very happy for one to maintain what we're doing. We're essentially uh, skimming across the top of the water. You're always going to have some you know, anomalies by 0.5 or 1% here and there. Uh, but for the most part, they're, they're very stellar. And we'll have to look at how we measure and maintain that in terms of a goal uh, to be hitting for performance activity. Nonetheless, we have met criteria number two. Uh, number three uh, was about our COP uh, exam, the Certificate of Occupational Proficiency. Uh, this is another uh, interesting uh, aspect here. Many years ago, uh, the state launched an endeavor to create uh, COP exams that would mirror MCAS exams, particularly for career technical schools. So it's the high stakes uh, accountability uh, testing for the career technical uh, programs. Um, the state also realized rather quickly that that is a tremendous expense, uh, that the, the prospect of a statewide testing system um, was prohibitively uh, expensive. Uh, they did start with, a, I think back when it was, uh, like it was 10 million or so, 10 or 15 million that they had put towards it. And just to give you an, an idea, uh, we spend that in the state on one subject in MCAS each year. Right? So and that's a simple paper pencil type test, never mind anything that would have a performance nature or anything like that. Uh, and so what we did, um, we were in the, in the early days, very proactive with designing uh, our own MCAS diagnostic type exams and so forth uh, to be prepared for the effort. Well, we did the same thing with the COP. And we had already gone ahead and designed our own COP exams. Uh, many of them, much like what the state was doing, are mirrored off of industry-based exams. So uh, in dental, it's the Danby. Uh, in you know, welding, it's the Notch uh, exams. And um, if you keep going here down the line. Um, we, we essentially uh, fashioned ourselves, if you will, after what was already in place for industry uh, exams and tests. In some places, in some cases, we use them. So for example, in auto tech, we use the ASC exams, uh, Automotive Service Excellence exams, as the cop. Uh, and many shops have gone on to do just that, uh, whether if they haven't made one themselves or fashioned one after one that already exists, then they use that exam itself for the student earns the credential. Uh, and so what you're seeing there on the purple sheet uh, is the long-term practice that we've had ever since of giving those exams anyways, waiting for the state to uh, formalize an effort to do so, but in the meantime, we're saying we're going to hold our students accountable and assess them on their progress. Uh, and so the reason I, I tell you the long history lesson there is because the reality is we still have language in here that talks about the DESE established uh, COP exams. I don't think it's ever going to happen. In fact, they'll bet my next paycheck on it. Um, however, we can, like we have been doing, uh, create rigorous uh, or utilize rigorous exams that already exist and certify our students' proficiency. We've been doing that, and the results are in front of you. They, they're passing it at very <coughs> high levels, uh, and we're proud of that. We also have been able to credential our students because of that success. So uh, I would say unequivocally we have met the intent uh, of criteria number three. But also I've given you some considerations of how we might revise that. Mm -hmm. One aspect of, of point three I would also add is that's been very nice for our students is that when those assessments are happening, advisory committee members and employers will come in and assess the hands-on piece and component. So there's almost like a, they come in as judges, so to speak, and they're participating with the shop and the student. And a lot of times this data helps us to distinguish what students go on and compete in Skills USA. So it also um, provides us with that opportunity for our students as well, based upon how well they do on those exams. I, I would like to point out, as she says that, um, 
two things you can see from that example. One, you can see why that would be prohibitively expensive at a statewide level. We have volunteerism of advisors who come in and will you know, put the students through performance exams and so forth. Um, but it also reminds me of another thing, that some of the comp exams here take over a week to administer. Uh, if, if the students do it for an entire cycle uh, or more. What we give is a window of time that we ask the instructors or the shops to administer their comps and get us the data, but um, they, they are expensive in that nature. They're both performance and written aspects of them. Many times involving outside parties or agencies. Do you have any questions at all? I uh, just have one comment. Information technology seems to be the one that uh, sticks out. My assumption is that you're going to uh, take a look at that and see what the uh, issue may or may not be. Yes. Yeah, as well as uh, testing. Yeah, well, I'm saying very low as well. <clears throat> but you got a couple there that obviously has brought that number down to that 96% level. So uh, you've got <coughs> some stellar ones like Auto Body. I'm really pleased to see that one uh, where it is. That's a tremendous turnaround from where it was. Uh, sure. And I'm sure that, that uh, next time you report, if we get a report like this again, that the information technology and the, uh, the auto tech, for instance, would also be uh, somewhat good. <coughs> I do know both cases. Can't analyze for you why the numbers are what they are, but they do know that in both cases they are using industry exams. So, for example, mm -hmm. ASC uh, in Auto Tech and in IT, they are using uh, industry certification exams. <coughs> so, for example, um, Java tests or C++ tests or whatever they may be. Um, uh, Cisco, I think, is what <coughs> they were working on. And if that's the case, it's pretty tough to do. Uh, I think they would have to assess, for example, hey boy, here's a tricky one, right? Uh, mm -hmm. If you give a kid a Cisco test, which if you can pass Cisco in high school and yeah. actually become Cisco certified, by yeah. the time you leave high school, it's pretty pretty remarkable. But if you're only passing your shop at an 80% rate, is that a bad thing? Um, boy, we're gonna have to be careful with that. Yes. To say, hey, come on, get us a better number here, 80%, and, and have them, go to, let's say, a lesser expectation just to drive a better number, we have to be careful, but yep. uh, we'll look into both of those. Okay. Or all of them. Really. That's fair. Okay. Any other questions? No. Okay, thank you. Do you need a, a vote yeah. on whether or not uh, the committee is in favor of uh, advancing the performance award? I'll make that motion. I'll second it. We have a motion from John. Um, we have a second. And Julie? Any other further comment on it? Yes. Regardless of the discussion over the metrics that were used, because naturally they go out of date after four years, I mean, I think I can speak for the negotiation subcommittee, which I've been a member on for a number of years, that I think we're really proud of having this type of an award with an evaluation over a four-year period. Um, it, I think it shows the partnership that we have with our teachers in that we can actually have performance-based evaluations of our academics and be in agreement with our teachers that that's appropriate and something that should be recognized. So, you know, regardless of the language, because it gets stale after four years and we'll, we'll create a better one next time, um, I just wanted to make that comment. I think the thing is uh, worth mentioning to amplify what Anthony said, this was one of the first ones in the state, if not perhaps the region or country, uh, where we actually had a uh, target and the a union, the teachers, agreed to that and we were able to hold them accountable for a result uh, with the teaching with the students. Uh, it was uh, a, a big breakthrough uh, because originally we were told that they, uh, they saw no reason to do that because they were professionals and didn't need an incentive this way. But they uh, finally uh, came on board with it, and uh, it has been, a, uh, in my opinion, and I think in the union's opinion, something that they're very proud of. So it's working well. All right, we have uh, some comment. We had a motion, we had a second. We had some comment. Any other comment on this? I'd like to call for a vote then on item 9.4. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Anybody abstain? So moved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, relay that to our faculty and staff.
Uh, the last item I have for you is the school cancellation list, 9.5, provided for your information. Case you want to tune in, but I don't plan on canceling or delaying school this year. <laughs> there we go. No snow this year. No snow. No. Uh, we made it through that initial storm. Actually, four of our sending towns uh, didn't close. Uh, we, we're still on pace. Any questions on 9.5? <coughs> Mr. Vice Chairman, thank you. And members of the committee, have a nice evening. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yes. A procedural recommendation. It occurred to me that it, um, to yes. be in compliance um, with the law that Ms. Mitchell may wish to abstain from the motion that was just yeah. taken. So if we can amend that vote to that reflect that unless anyone has an issue. Can someone else make the second vote? Yes. Chet, seconded it. Okay. Fair, be Fair. It's going to be recorded as an abstention here. So you've got a, a yay and yeah. an a nay and there's one abstention. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Chet. No names. Okay, huh? No names. No. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, budget subcommittee report. Chair John. Yes, uh, again, another year. I was elected chair again. Congratulations. And, uh, hey, congratulations. You know, but now I have a new vice chair. There you uh, go. Things change. Yes. So, budget season is upon us. Hope everybody's, you know, checking their belts nice and tight. Keep things as tight as we can. Uh, and basically, tonight we just went over the, uh, the calendars. And uh, just basically the, the 8,000 folks in the first review of it. It was a short meeting. And going forward, all our budget subcommittee meetings will be held in the uh, superintendent's conference room. None of them will be held here. So there'll be no distraction with the committee versus the members coming in before the full school committee. So if you come in and we're not here, this is where we're at. We're up there having the meeting beforehand. And, and the meetings will be posted in that fashion. Yes, yeah, it'll be posted in that fashion. Yes. And the meetings will, that are not here, will, will start at 5.30. The ones that we don't have on the full school committee in the calendar. Bob, the calendar will change. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, Doc, I don't know if you have a synopsis or an overview of the whole year to come. You know, budget, we don't we don't have any state not yet. numbers or anything, but, you know, we'll see where it, Shakes out. If I may, uh, Mr. Chairman, on that, we do have the uh, official October 1 headcount uh, and what the uh, appropriate uh, increases and decreases are by town for each one of your own towns. Uh, you should be appraised of that so you know whether, for instance, if you have some, uh, I think there was one town there, I can't remember the name of it, but I think it was one town that was like 17, uh, increased 17 students. Uh, that's a significant increase yeah. to anybody's budget, especially the, the towns we serve. So you should know where you stand. Make sure you understand that. Uh, if you got the wild swings that Doc and, and uh, his administration has already uh, alerted the folks to, but you should be appraised as well. Fair enough? Yes, fair enough. Okay. Uh, Superintendent Director's Report, Dr. Fitz. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, item 11.1. .1. Periodically, we're asked to chime in to, to uh, indicate to our legislative contingent uh, whether they, um, we recommend they oppose uh, or support legislation. We were alerted by the Mass Association of Vocational Administrators that the uh, apprenticeship electric electricians had continued to uh, make changes in the hours to qualify that exceeded that which could be earned during the vocational technical high school four year experience. So we asked our electrical teachers to um, share their thoughts on it. They recommended that we oppose the legislation. The Mass Association of Vocational Administrators recommended that we oppose the legislation. So I therefore wrote to our legislative contingent uh, and continue to receive responses from either our senators or reps that um, they, they would do what they could to not advance or support this legislation. And um, we, we prefer to work with any of the outside agencies for licensing or additional credentialing. Uh, and just ask them to be sensitive that, you know, obviously we have high school requirements and all kinds of other things that a, a youngster would have to complete. And uh, we want to create gateways of opportunity, not new obstacles uh, to gain entrance to these programs. So, 
Um, it appears that this legislation, Bill Number H-136, uh, will not be advanced uh, in the viewpoint of our legislature. Oh, cool. Good. Doc, is it the last I heard this had gone to the Joint Committee for Consumer Protection? Is it still, in, still with them, or...? I, I, it, it was, yes, the last I knew it was, which they feel to be a graveyard. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. Uh, any, any other questions? Um, yeah. Item 11.2. Um, in our consistent pursuit of additional supportive donations over and above the, the, the dollars from uh, our assessments, we uh, continue to uh, pursue additional money uh, uh, I believe, let me just back up just a moment. I believe the school committee has uh, communication from Representative Brian Murray uh, su supporting uh, our position on that legislation as the, one of the more recent communications, and we we'll continue to share others. In any case, uh, the NESDEC group, one of the organizations which we're a member, the New England School Development Council, was kind enough to award a $4,000 mini grant to us that will assist us in professional development. Okay, so that we can uh, have our staff increase their skills, <coughs> uh, particularly in the area of autistic uh, skill sets for certain students. Uh, and so this grant was awarded. Any questions on that? Seeing none. Uh, in our traditional fashion, uh, working with Nicole, we, uh, I, I can't tell, I, I refuse to tell Nicole she's done all that she can do until she gets Dean Bank, whatever. So that's on a lifetime quest, but anyway. So, but uh, you gotta go to. the, the milk, uh, the milk, they've actually come here, but we're still working on it. Yeah. Um, the Milford but Federal Savings um, was one of, one of the more recent that awarded uh, the, uh, the gift of 3500 that we use for the gas and maintenance and, uh, of our vehicles that use the project. And we can pay thank you to the CEO of the bank and their board. Uh, Item 11.2C, we received $4,500 from Blissful Meadows Company Open, uh, the, uh, in the more recent award, uh, and we, uh, and I believe that to share with the school committee and just email version just to make you aware that um, kind of an indication of my grant pursuits that when I, I met someone who was in charge of the foundation of the hometown bank uh, at the um, walk for a staff member for, for the health <laughs> issue. Uh, he indicated that he would consider uh, supporting, so I knew they wrote to him. And so we're in pursuit of another award there. So we're going to continue to, to do that. Uh, as you look at grants, I know we've had a, a pretty good discussion uh, in response <coughs> to Mr. Yitt's request for our, our process and information. Uh, you might also notice that when we submit an application and we're not successful, we don't give up and that we're going to go back out, all right? Uh, and we're, we're trying to, uh, give an, give an, to be given a second bite on the apple, if you will, uh, with the skills grant in the governor's office. And so we're currently in pursuit of that and we're going to continue to do that. So, uh, any questions on any of those? <coughs> Seeing none, moving on. If the committee member in any way is aware or uh, is aware of other sources, if you let us know, we'd be glad to pursue that and investigate that. Uh, and uh, you know, add that to our ability to do more things. Uh, we've had a variety of visitors uh, that come through the school, and, and we have more that are scheduled. The recent visitors include uh, two members of the National Latino Educational Institute from Chicago, accompanied by a professor <coughs> from Boston College, uh, and we were able to provide information uh, to them about what we do and how we do it, uh, and they wish to replicate Blackstone Valley Tech and its design in Chicago for the minority populations. WBUR reached out to us and asked to come visit to uh, interview students and staff members for a broadcast that they ran. Uh, and uh, this is WBUR as all yeah. things considered. Sounds like this. <laughs> there it is. Sorry, sorry about that. No problem. This is WBUR as all things considered. I'm Lisa Mullins. Troy LaFond is a polite and determined high school senior from Bellingham. He got top grades in AP Chemistry and Language. He plans to go into aerospace engineering, and then? I want to work on rockets and drones that would go into space and hopefully eventually get humans back into space and onto planets and moons. Meet the new breed of vocational school student. LaFond is in the engineering track of Blackstone Valley Regional Vocational Technical High School in Upton. Vocational schools are no longer considered repositories for students 
who can't hack the academics of traditional high school or kids who have little aspiration. Volk Tech schools today have rigorous academics and hands-on training. And the schools are increasingly seen as a 21st century employer's treasure chest as places that are preparing the future workforce for a radically changed landscape of jobs. All this week, WBUR and our Bostonomics team are focusing on the future of work. As we're hearing in our series, some of the fields with the biggest job growth are healthcare, computers, and food service. So these are from a dinner we did the other night. Caramelized onion and goat cheese croissants. It would be rude not to. This is a huge commercial kitchen for the culinary arts program at Blackstone Valley. One student is standing in front of a big pile of chicken breast she's chopping up. Others are cooking a slew of quesadillas. Across the way is the machine shop. That's where a senior, Michelle Yitz from Grafton, is sitting at a computer. She loves manufacturing. She's made metal chess pieces and created her own roses made of copper and brass. She's also learning multimedia, an industry of the future. She plans to combine the two fields. I definitely want to do something with media that kind of advocates for manufacturing because when I came in here, I knew nothing about it. I thought it was a dirty, disgusting place where like you push buttons and you didn't do anything. But I want to kind of help show people the reality of what manufacturing is. Michelle Yitz and Troy LaFont plan to go to four-year colleges. Last year, 70% of Blackstone students went on to four-year schools. But there are so many kids who want to follow in their footsteps and go to folk schools, Massachusetts cannot keep up with the demand. As of 2015, there were 3,200 students on waiting lists for vocational tech schools in the state. Meanwhile, 75% of Massachusetts employers say they can't find qualified people to fill their jobs in everything from manufacturing to retail to finance. That's according to a recent survey that found that many business owners would like to see Voc Tech education expanded. The longtime superintendent and lead cheerleader for the Blackstone Regional Voc Tech School District is Michael Fitzpatrick. He says Voc Tech schools have come a long way from the days they had to use donated surplus machines. The equipment you would have found here 25 years ago was uh, dated 1953 or before and therefore it trained skills that were no longer needed or competitive for the job market at the time. It certainly didn't allow employers or manufacturers or machinists to create and compete opportunities in their environments. Now, in the manufacturing shop we're standing in, there's sophisticated computerized design equipment to be used with 3D printer applications. Students even use 3D printing in the culinary arts program. And when you can see a culinary arts student doing a food-based coliseum that resembles that of the, you know, Rome, you can see the artistic work, the science work, the social studies, the creative writing, the imagination that takes place. That forms an ability for that individual to springboard into all kinds of new opportunity and innovation and add new values wherever he or she would go. So you think that when a business comes in and says, this, I, what I really need is, for instance, critical thinking skills, communication skills, are the kids who are learning to use a 3D printer learning that? There is an array, there's a menu of unlimited opportunities to promote critical thinking. And <coughs> vocational technical teachers from both the academic and vocational side are masterful at creating learning opportunities that, that capture the new technologies and the new skill sets to respond to this new challenge. Fitzpatrick says Voc Tech schools in the state are required to involve business leaders in the development of their curricula. Think of one meeting that you've had with a business leader and how that has changed what's happening in the classroom. Consigli Construction is one of the largest construction firms in, uh, in the Commonwealth. In our interactions with them and with other uh, smaller contractors, they've indicated that students need teaming skills, communication skills, and drafting skills, not only framing or, or actual hands-on labor activities. And what do you do with that information? The teacher would then work with other members of the team to reconfigure what lessons would be taught. So how do you teach when you don't know what the challenge is going to be in 10 years? When you don't know where certain technologies are going, how do you prepare for that? You focus on behavior and learning process, not on a specific topic or task. You have to have an instructional staff willing to constantly add new skills, new licenses, new training, new software applications to their teaching. Can you give us an example? Uh, an example from construction technology. Uh, years ago, if you're building a, you know, a kind of a roof activity, you might use a chalk line Okay, for the roof construction to make sure that you were geometrically uh, aligned as far as the shingles. Today you probably use a laser. 
Yeah, because I think probably a lot of students here, are, you know, hear that uh, many of the jobs of the future are going to be done by robots or drones, and so they're probably wondering what's left for me. That's an interesting analogy or metaphor. In my opinion, years ago, uh, the vocational technical training may have viewed the student as the robot. Today, the student will program, design, and repair the robot. They won't be the robot. That's Michael Fitzpatrick, superintendent of the Blackstone Valley Regional Vocational Technical School District. The state spends about $5,000 more per student in vocational high schools than for students in traditional schools. That's because of the smaller class size and the expense of equipment. In an effort to help voc tech schools expand capacity and purchase new equipment, the state gave $36 million in grants to voc schools and programs and to community colleges over the last two years. It's going to give an additional $45 million over the next three years. Tomorrow on Morning Edition, there's a looming shortage of home health aids for the elderly. We'll take a look at high-tech startups creating new devices to ease the pressure on caregivers. For all of WBR's Bostonomics series, the future of work, including interactive graphs showing what industries are growing and which are declining, go to our website, wbur.org. The, uh, it's interesting. We received a beautiful message uh, of how much they enjoyed the interaction with our students. And we really wanted them to focus on students. Uh, none of that was rehearsed. It's a one-time take. Uh, one of the things that the radio station uh, group wanted to capture was the noise of the laboratory behind them. So they, they have some machine shop, things like that. Nicole was kind enough to, to do some of the lead activities. And so when she got into culinary, um, they thought it might be best for her to taste some of the French fries and things. <laughs> and, and so, 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 so chewing in the background? Uh, don't, you, don't, me, don't beat me to the punchline. Uh, so, so, so people said to me, I said to Nicole, I said, you know, the, you, you hear the, you know, the, the clatter of pots and pans, yeah. and you hear the machinery operating or the 3D printer. And I said, can you see people saying to me, what was that noise on the radio? Oh, that was Nicole eating French fries. <laughs> 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 Thought I heard chewing. <laughs> she, she began to chew quietly. <laughs> anyway, that was the interview with the radio people. And uh, we've already received the acknowledgement from the vocational community and others. Nice. Uh, best marketing tool we have is our students. What they do and all that they can do. Um, uh, we had retired generals from across the world, to uh, almost 80 of them school from the National Defense University, which promotes relationships uh, to Washington, D.C., uh, and these fellowships uh, that they uh, <coughs> bring these uh, former military leaders from across uh, to our school. Now, a couple of years ago, they asked to come for a quick visit, and in fairness, uh, Nipmuc did this before we did it, and they the group discovered us because of the geographical location, uh, and they asked if they could stop by here. So they stopped by, and they saw the facility. Then a year later, they asked if they could come for half the day instead of just an hour. <laughs> and so they came in, and uh, this time they asked if they could come okay. for a day. And so we don't know if they're going to see him for a week. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, but so they seem to really connect with, and you would imagine, the military with all its qualification of, of skill sets, mm -hmm. right, which is really where the cops come from, yeah. okay, the certificate of occupational proficiency. Uh, and um, they're all cross reference uh, with a data bank uh, at the national level in these skill sets and things like that. And they cross over to uh, the, uh, the standards and the licensing in many of the programs. Uh, in any case, it's, it's a, what a way to get ready for uh, you know, a Veterans Day uh, to interact. And these people, you know, uh, they're, they're, I mean, they're from Ukraine, they're from New Zealand, they're just from everywhere, okay? Uh, and they're, they're very humble. Uh, they're very polite, uh, and they're very inquisitive. They ask lots of questions, and, and they seem to enjoy themselves. So, and we did not charge them the tour. Say, did we sell them snacks? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't sell them snacks, huh? Yeah, no, no. They did pay for their lunch. Yeah. So, <laughs> we did charge them the fee. We thank them for their service to their respective country. Yeah, take them to the store. <laughs> Any questions on that? So, Nicole, thank you for your help. Uh, seeing no questions, 11.4, I think you have the new parent newsletter, which has a number of dates in there. And we encourage you to take a peek at that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. That concludes my report. Mr. Uh, 12, uh, new business. Anybody have any new business? Uh, I do have something here that uh, Joe Hall had asked me to read. It is uh, uh, 
from the Greater Milford Ballet Association. Uh, they are having a production of the Nutcracker, <coughs> Nutcracker Ballet uh, this year presents BVT senior Megan O'Brien as a featured soloist. Performances will be held at the King Philip High School in Rentham on December 16th and 17th at 2 o'clock. Nice. Tickets are on sale at the Dean Dance Studio. Uh, the phone number is 508-473-3354 or by calling Lucia Copeland at 774-287-9205. Uh, just a, a bit on Megan. Uh, Megan has appeared in the Nutcracker for the last nine years and has been working very hard to perfect her dances and we hope that many in her community will come out to support her. So uh, we congratulate her on that and uh, obviously nine years worth of work on that. And again, a BBT uh, first to have this, uh, this young lady be out there at the Nutcracker Suite. So if you get an opportunity to a Nutcracker Ballet, if you get an opportunity to go to that, uh, please uh, consider. Thank you. Any other new business? Yes. Doc, I'd like an update for everybody about the football team. Sure. How good we're doing this year? Yeah, the football on. team is scheduled to play Saturday at Foley uh, Stadium in Worcester at 11 o'clock uh, against uh, Wakona High School, the Western champion. Uh, and if whoever is victorious in that game advances to Gillette Stadium. Oh, cool. Good. Good right. uh, the Traft family has expanded the availability of the Super Bowls uh, to all eight divisions oh, good. Uh, and uh, gone into Friday night and Saturday because they couldn't accommodate more than six on one day. Right. So now there would be, I think, two games played on Friday and then six games played on Saturday. So Is that the following yeah. weekend? Uh, it, it's, I think it's December 1st and 2nd. 1st and 2nd. Okay. Yeah. But uh, you got to win to get there. Yep. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. One game at a time. Yeah. Uh, that'd be uh, yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah, it's going to be a good game. Yeah. Plus, we also have the Thanksgiving game. Uh, the, the captains from both Nipmuc and Valley Tech will be having lunch here. Uh, and if both teams are in their Super Bowl efforts, then you'll probably see JV players on both sides of the Thanksgiving game. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, but, yeah. But, uh, that's, good, been, that's good news. You know, it's been a great season. Yeah. 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 So, uh, hmm. Uh, item 13, items for the good of the committee. Anybody have anything else I'd like to add or anything I'd like to bring forward to anybody? Seeing none. Uh, next regularly scheduled school committee meeting uh, is December 21st, 17th. And uh, meeting closure. Meeting close is declared by the chair. I can close the meeting without the uh, benefit of Roll call, correct? And happy Thanksgiving to all. Yes. Happy yeah. Thanksgiving, everyone. Thanksgiving. Thank you, you very must much. Be